കരുണാർണവമായി കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം ഈദ Namaste and welcome to our discussion on the first verse of Drigdrishya Viveka. So this is a wonderful verse and because it's so nicely written I want to share the Sanskrit with you. This is not about Sanskrit <laughs> but it's just so beautiful that when I first read it it my hair stood on end. I mean it was really a wonderful verse. so tersely and compactly written and yet embodying a very deep truth about the nature of reality so let's take a look at it drig drishya vivekaha text 1 rupam drishyam lochanam drik sadrishyam drik tu manasam ദൃശ്യാധീവൃത്തയ സാക്ഷി ദൃഗേവ നാതുദൃശ്യതെ ഫോം ഇസ് പെർസീവ്ഡ് ആൻഡ് ദി ഐ ഇസ് ദി പെർസീവർ ഇറ്റ് ദി ഐ ഇസ് പെർസീവ്ഡ് ആൻഡ് ദി മൈൻഡ് ഇസ് ഇറ്റ്സ് പെർസീവർ ദി മൈൻഡ് വിത്ത് ഇറ്റ്സ് മോഡിഫിക്കേഷൻസ് ഇസ് പെർസീവ്ഡ് ആൻഡ് ദി വിറ്റ്നസ് സെൽഫ് ഇസ് വെറിലി ദി പെർസീവർ ബട്ട് ഇറ്റ് the self is not perceived by any other so let's take a look at it line by line rupam drishyam form is perceived lochanam drik the eye is the perceiver tad drishyam drik the eye is perceived tu manasam and the mind is its perceiver drishyadi vrittaya sakshi drigeva the mind is perceived and the witness is verily the perceiver na tu drishyate but the self is not perceived by any other so this is such a wonderful verse and the style in which it's written is the style of the entire book so everything is very compact and well stated i'm not going to go through the sanskrit of the subsequent verses <laughs> i don't want to scare everybody away but this verse is an example of the style of the whole book and indeed it contains the essence of the meaning of the whole book let's take a look at it graphically form means the world and it is perceived and the i and other senses is the perceiver but the i is also perceived and in this case the mind which is called adi vrittaya or the modifications or mental modifications is the perceiver and i've rendered it here as a mirror for a certain reason which we'll come to in a couple of episodes but the mind is also the perceived and the perceiver of the mind is the witness atman or self but the self has no perceiver so let me just explain a little bit about the terms in this verse by form we mean all objects of the senses so that could be not only uh light and form but sound and hearing smell taste touch and all of these things appear to be separate objects okay the key word here is appear they appear to be separate and they appear to be different from oneself and of course we know this is duality this is maya this is not what really is but this is the way it appears when we are in the conditioned state so then the mind perceives the sense organs just like the sense organs perceive the objects of the senses 
the mind perceives the senses and it becomes the perceiver, the senses become the object. So what happens here? How it is that the senses, if they're objects, become perceivers? Well, because they're associated with the mind. They're connected to the mind. The mind is the energy that drives the senses. And because the senses are connected or associated with the mind, they appear to be active but actually they're just passive instruments. Let's take the eye for example. The eye is like a camera. It has a lens, it has an iris, a diaphragm, and it admits light, and it registers that light and turns it into electrical signals which then go to the brain. Huh? And the brain presents these patterns of signals to the mind, and this is what we perceive as sight. So because <laughs> the eye is connected to the mind, through the brain, it appears to be active, but actually without the mind, the eye doesn't function. When the subtle body, which is the mind, the manomaya kosha, leaves this body at the time of death, the eye and all the other senses become inert. So actually they are inert all the time. <laughs> They're just machines, biological, very sophisticated, but still machines. And when the energy, the pranamaya kosha and the manomaya kosha, the mind, when they leave this gross body at the time of death, the whole thing becomes inert, just a piece of meat. So we can understand that the senses are active because they're connected with the mind. The mind is the perceiver and the senses are the perceived. So then in its turn, the mind, the manomaya kosha, becomes perceived by consciousness. And consciousness, of course, is the ananda maya kosha and the vijnana maya kosha. So the Vijnana Maya Kosha is the consciousness called conditioned consciousness, which looks out on the world through the senses and the mind. And because the mind is associated with this consciousness, it appears to be active. It appears to be the perceiver of the senses, but actually the mind is also just a machine. And the proof of that is that we can build machines, computers, that mimic many of the functions of the mind, such as memory, perception, calculation, and so on. So if we can build a machine that demonstrates functions of the mind, it means the mind is also a machine. And the only reason that machine is active is because it's associated with consciousness. Consciousness is different from awareness, but for the first few verses, we're going to take them as the same. The actual quality of the self is pure awareness, unconditioned awareness without an object. But when that awareness becomes intelligence, it's directed outwards toward the object of the mind. And because the intelligence is directing the mind, Look at this, look at that. Huh? This is called attention. Then the mind appears to be active. But if the intelligence is withdrawn, for example, in samadhi, in deep meditation, the mind also becomes inactive. So this is the proof that the mind is actually just a machine. It's not really alive. It doesn't do anything on its own. It has to be directed by intelligence. Intelligence is will. Icha shakti. And jnana shakti is the self. So, although there's a subtle distinction there, we're lumping them all now just temporarily under the term consciousness. Because consciousness is the actual active force, the actual perceiver that animates all these other things, the mind, the senses, and so on. So if the body is just a machine, 
and the senses and the mind are just inert matter operated by consciousness, well, what is it about consciousness that makes them work? Huh? But this is the mystery of life. How is it that consciousness can be connected with matter? Well, the point is the mental modifications, the vrittis, as they're called in this verse. Vritti means something that's overlaid or superimposed on something else. So in the case of the mind, what is the mind really? Huh? There actually is no one entity called mind, manasa. The, the term mind is simply an aggregate, just like the term body. Huh? We know the body is made up of many different organs, and those organs are made up of many, many cells, billions, trillions of them. So actually the body is an aggregate of all these things, the organs, the senses, and so on. So there is no one thing called body, and that's why some parts of the body can get sick or even fail, but the body as a whole still can remain alive. In the same way, the mind is not one thing, but it's a collection of vrittis or modifications. Modifications of what? Consciousness. Now we've talked about these things. Chittam means conditioned consciousness. Consciousness that thinks I am the ego. I am this body. I am the mind and the thoughts. And then there are the upadis. Upadi means a covering. Huh? So a covering covers or obscures what's underneath it, the substrate. So here the substrate is consciousness and the upadis are limiting adjuncts that are not really part of consciousness. They're actually maya. Huh? And they cover the consciousness and give it the appearance of being individual and being separate and being part of the body and so on. These are all the uh, upadis. And then there's the vasanas. Vasanas are mental tendencies which come from previous lives or earlier in this life. They're habits, really. And habits then push our mind in a certain direction so all these things cover our actual consciousness, which is the self, Brahman, uh, Atman, God. Because these coverings are there, we think we're an individual, we think we're separate from everything else, we think that we're an object, uh, a body, and we think that we live in this world full of all kinds of separate objects, uh, but this is all illusion. This is all simply the upadis. And then when we release these upadis, when we let go of the vasanas, don't listen, don't pay attention to them anymore. And when we finally uh, release the conditioning, uh, the, the chittam, conditioned consciousness, and come to the original pure consciousness of chit, that is liberation, that is enlightenment, that is reality. So when we sit to meditate, uh, where the rubber meets the road here, <laughs> when we sit to meditate, we have to realize the senses are inactive. They may appear to be doing this and that, but that's only because the mind is driving them. And the mind is also inactive. Just leave it, take your attention off it, and it stops. Now the problem is we have all these vasanas or habits that direct our attention toward the mind and the senses. But if we use a little bit of willpower and resist them, then the mind will stop, the attention turns within and finds Brahman, the self, and leads us step by step towards complete liberation.
ओम तत्सत ओम शक्ति ओम